What I'm concerned about, and again, this is to your point, is we may be heading into both. And every, if everything I said about Hello everyone, today our guest is Jim Rickards. James G. Rickards is an American lawyer, economist, investment banker, speaker, media commentator, and author on matters of finance and precious metals. He is the author of Currency Wars, The Making of the Next Global Crisis, and six other books. He lives in New Hampshire. In this video, Jim Rickards talks about the rising inflation and interest rates, the strength of dollar and its impact and deep analysis of global and U.S. economy and macro environment. If you enjoy this highlight videos, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you. Stubbornly high inflation has Wall Street worried that the Federal Reserve will respond by raising interest rates until the United States tumbles into recession, taking the weakening global economy with it. While analysts say the U.S. economy grew in the third quarter, signs of trouble are multiplying here and abroad. Higher mortgage rates are chilling the U.S. housing market, energy shortages are hurting German factory output, and recurring coronavirus lockdowns are hobbling Chinese businesses. The Fed and other central banks are tightening credit to fight historically high inflation even as three of the world's main economic engines, the United States, Europe, and China, are sputtering. With the United States and other governments also reducing spending on pandemic relief measures, the global economy is getting less support from policymakers than at almost any time in 50 years, the World Bank said on Thursday in a new report that warned of rising global recession risks. And I hate to use the word conundrum because Greenspan used it, but conundrum is a fancy way of saying I don't really understand what's going on. But um, but this is a conundrum for a lot of people because they look at it, the U.S. objectively, okay, our, our debt to GDP ratio is over 130% highest in U.S. history, um, tons of research coming from um, obviously Ken Rogoff, but really Carmen Reinhardt, Vincent Reinhardt and others, but many others, not just them, that says um, at those debt to GDP ratios, you um, you can't grow. Uh, you, you can maybe refinance and muddle through, but it always ends either in um, default, which is unlikely because we can print the money, that much is true, or um, extreme inflation where here's your trillion dollars back, good luck buying a loaf of bread. So we'll, we'll see how that plays out, but the way it's playing out in real time is that the U.S. economic growth is incredibly weak. So we've got high, uh, sky high debt to GDP ratio. By the way, when you look at other countries in the world, you say, okay, who, who's at that lunch table, you know, 130%? The answer is Lebanon, Greece, uh, Italy, th those are, your, those are your, your lunch partners, so to speak. Economic growth is weak. Uh, we're in a recession. I don't care what Janet Yellen says. I don't consider her expert on the topic, but we've had our two consecutive quarters of declining GDP. Like it or not, that's the definition of recession. Um, the fact that the National Bureau of Economic Research, which is a private group, by the way, but they're the recognized referees on recessions and recoveries, the fact that they haven't said so doesn't mean anything because they never do say so until you know nine months or a year um, after it happened. And for that matter, most recessions are two quarters, some three. Some have been longer, but but most recessions are a couple of quarters. The the National Bureau of Economic Research usually declares a recession after it's already over. Like it started, it happened, it's over. We're in recovery. And they go, oh by the way, we had a recession last January. Uh, okay, so they'll probably get back to us. I, I would bet heavily after the election. And what Wall Street does, they look at what they have and they project all the rest based on regressions and correlations, which, you know, don't necessarily hold up. But this, okay, here's what we think. Here's our forecast for third quarter GDP based on uh, projections of what we don't know. Atlanta doesn't do that. Atlanta takes what we do know, hard data, and they ask a different question. They say, what would GDP be now if this was all we had? And they put out a number, but uh, they don't guess at the stuff they don't have. And it fills in as it goes along. So it's much more Bayesian in that sense. Um, but because of how the data comes out, the, the time sequence to which the data comes out, it typically fades as the quarter goes on. It's not because they're using a uh, bad methodology. It's just because that's how they do it. Um, and so just in the last uh, week, nine days or so, 
it went, you know, everyone was cheering. I think with uh, September 1st, it was 2.3%, maybe a little higher, but about 2.3%. Two days later, it was 1.6, and now it's down to 1.3. So it's following that pattern, I would expect by the end of September, we still got three weeks to go, given what I said about how it fades, it, it, it doesn't have to be negative, but it could very well be negative. Maybe three quarters of decline in GDP, but whatever it is, it's going to be weak. So if it's positive, you know, two tenths or three tenths, I mean, that's okay. But you're still rounding our away from recession. It doesn't mean the problem's over. So uh, debt to GDP is sky high, economy weak at best, probably had a recession in the first half. Maybe that's continuing. Um, People talk unemployment close to an all-time low, went up a little bit in the last report. Yeah, but even at 3.5% or so, uh, that that is extremely low. I mean, I go back to the 1960s and uh, that was that was low, low by the measures of the 1960s. But that completely ignores probably eight to 10 million Americans who were, were perfectly able of having jobs and working, um, prime, you know, prime age, 25 to 54 years old, who are not in the workforce. Uh, why is the dollar so strong? And the answer is for this, you have to go behind the curtain. You have to look into the, what's called the plumbing of the international monetary system. And I had a discussion um, and this goes back, this is 1980. Uh, so I'm a, you know, an up young up and coming vice president of Citibank. That's back uh, back in the days when it was a bank before they turned it into a hedge fund. Uh, so <laughs> I'm, I'm like a 27 or whatever, a 28 maybe year old lawyer. Um, but I'm I'm talking to Walter Riston. It's you know, a one-on-one -on -one conversation. He was, mm -hmm. for those who don't know the name or don't recall, he was probably the second greatest banker of the 20th century after Pierpont Morgan. So I'll give Morgan the prize. Uh, yeah. But he, he left around 1910. Uh, but um, and Riston was the inventor of the euro dollar. Oh, oh sorry, the, the the negotiable certificate of deposit. Euro dollars are around a little bit earlier. But he took the CD that that represent that was your interest in the euro dollar, made them negotiable and tradable. Um, so I'm having a conversation with him, and I I had just seen this movie, which I highly recommend. It. Chris Christopherson, Hume Cronin, and Jane Fonda. It's called Rollover. Uh, and it's again 1980, but all star cast. Yeah, I got a murder mystery, a little sex thrown in, but it's uh, it's basically about the collapse of confidence in the U.S. dollar. And Hume mm -hmm. Cronin plays the Walter Riston part. Um, and basically, the idea was the remember this is during the the Arab oil embargoes and the Iranian oil embargo, and price of oil quadrupled in eight years and all that. So the the theme was the the Arabs are taking the money out of the banking system and buying gold. And they're stashing the gold away. This is the, the collapse of the financial system. That was sort of the plot. So I said, you know, uh, Mr. Riston, uh, uh, what about that? You know, everyone took their money out of the system and uh, bought gold. Wouldn't that collapse the system? And he looked at me like I was the new kid on the block, which I was. And he said, well, what you have to understand is that you can take your money out of the bank and you can buy gold. But the person who sold you the gold got the money and they put it back in the bank so it doesn't go anywhere. It's a closed circuit. And of course, now I'm like, oh, oh yeah, you're right. Of course, he's right. Um, and he said, so the the uh, stability of the system doesn't depend on who sells what for dollars. Yeah, it affects exchange rates a little bit and um, uh, interest rates with the price of gold. But he said the money always, it can't literally disappear it has to go back into the system it's a closed circuit and of course that's how the euro dollar system works um but the one thing we um uh but it presupposes that you can always borrow in the euro dollar market in other words every, that closed circuit uh analogy is correct provided the big banks are willing to lend to each other. So if the, mm -hmm. my example, if UBS was selling the gold and to the Arabs and they got the money and they put it back in Citibank Nassau, it's all good. Um, but what happens if that money supply, now I'm talking about Euro dollars, uh, actually shrank? Uh, mm -hmm. And that is a heart attack in the global financial system. We're like, well, okay, what's going on? And believe it or not, there's a global dollar shortage. And when you say that, people say, wait a second, are you kidding me? The Fed printed, you know, the, the Fed's balance sheet in 2008 at the start of the global financial crisis was $800 billion. It was four and a half trillion by the time we got to the end of the taper in, in uh, November, 2014. 
then okay, um, yelling a little bit, but mostly Powell got it. They started quantitative tightening. They got it back down to around 3.5 trillion by the time COVID came along, and then boom, it's up to seven and a half trillion. Might have gone higher than that, and that's M zero. Um, you know, M one was was exploding even more. So people go, let's so the Fed printed. You know, seven and a half trillion dollars. How could there be a how could there be a dollar shortage? Um, and that that has a two part answer. One is the money printing, at least M zero, is irrelevant. It just doesn't matter because they how do they print the money? Well, they the Fed buys securities from the primary dealer. What do the banks do with that money? They give it back to the Fed in the form of excess reserves, the bank deposit at the Fed, in effect. Mm -hmm. So that money never went anywhere. It was created, it is on the balance sheet, but it all went to the asset side, which were securities, and it never went into the economy. So where does the money come from that runs the economy? If you know you or I want to go shopping or go out to- A dinner, multiplier, or, right? Or Isn't that what? Well, yeah. it comes from the commercial banks. It comes from M1. Yeah, there is a multiplier, but it that's in M1 and M2, which is created by the banks at will. And the Fed, those commercial banks have as much printing power as the Fed. They just do it differently by lending money or or um, or buying securities and, and paying for them with money that they create. But the but the opposite is true. You can have a um, recession without a financial panic. Uh, 1990, we had you know, kind of a mild recession. Um, there was no financial panic then. Uh, 2020 was interesting. That was, I don't know what to call it. I mean, technically a recession, but yeah. you know the the economy drops. 31% annualized in, they say two quarters, first and second quarter of 2020, but it was really two months. I mean, if you break it down, it was March and April. They, they just happened uh -huh. to be, they happened to fall in two quarters and took both quarters negative, but it was really two months, down 31% in annualized in two months, and then up 35% by the third quarter. I mean, that was crazy. So maybe that's technically a recession, but that that's, well, that's just what happens when you shut down the economy. We don't need to mm -hmm. be macroeconomists who say, hey, you, show, you close down the economy, that's what happens. But there was not a financial panic. Stock market fell, but the banks didn't fail. Um, yeah. And nobody was worried about, you know, nobody's lined up to take the money out of Citibank, et cetera. Um, but sometimes they, so you can have recessions without panics. You can have panics without recessions. October 19th, 1987, Dow falls 22% one day, mm -hmm. no recession. But sometimes they do go together. In 2008, they did. We had both. We had an honest to goodness financial panic. Uh, everyone knows, you know, Bear Stearns, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Lehman, AIG. But uh, I, mean, I can tell you, and I've spoken to a lot of people, Morgan Stanley was days away. If you had, huh. had to talk to John Mack, he's like, hey, I, I got no time to bail out Lehman. We're trying to keep afloat ourselves. And then Goldman would have been behind that, probably City, and um, yeah, maybe JP Morgan would have been the last one standing. <laughs> Um, so, uh, and the economy collapsed and the stock market fell uh, well over 50%, I think 60%. So that was an example of both. And what I'm concerned about, and again, this is to your point, is we may be heading into both. And was every, if everything I said about what's behind the curtain, the plumbing of the financial system, acute dollar shortage, scramble for collateral, which leads to deleveraging, because if I can't get the collateral, I got to take the trade off. Yeah. Deleveraging of balance sheets, et cetera. Uh, which are the early warning signs of a global financial panic. And the expectation was that the pivot would come as early as January or February 2023, right. or some people were even saying December 2022. And that's what, that's the signal that the inverted euro dollar futures curve is sending. But as I said, it doesn't mean the Fed gets them. Are they, is the Fed looking at euro dollar futures? I don't think so. I think they're looking at the Phillips curve, which is a joke. Um, we're looking at the unemployment rate, which is misleading. Um, you know, and I love it when the employment report comes out and says, you know, uh, you know, wages were up 5% on an annualized basis. And like, yeah, that's nominal and inflation is eight. Right. So you're down three. People are losing money. Yeah. Um, but so, yeah, yeah, the Fed will pivot eventually, but um, it'll be too late. It'll be after the damage is done, after we're in a deep recession, mm -hmm. unemployment rising. Since 1981, U.S. and global growth have largely moved in tandem, according to Citigroup research. In each of the four global recessions since 1980, the United States, which accounts for roughly one quarter of world gross domestic product, or GDP, 
slowed either right before the global economy fell into a slump or at the same time. The IMF said this summer that the global economy was in danger of slipping into recession as a result of aftershocks from the war in Ukraine, the pandemic, and inflation. The IMF alarm followed a World Bank warning of the risk of global stagflation, a toxic combination of persistently high prices and anemic growth. If you enjoy this highlight videos, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you.